Hi, welcome back. Uh, last week we discussed a very important law of dialectics, that is the law of the transformation of quantity into quality, which describes how change takes place. This week we're going to discuss another important law, which is called the negation of the negation. And that describes not just how change takes place, but how development happens, which is very important to understand. Now, uh, last week when we discussed uh, quantity and quality, it's also worth noting that that involves uh, two polar opposites, that is quantity and quality, right? The two of those, those opposites are define one another, shall we say. There's an interpenetration of opposites that makes that law uh, what it is. And for dialectics, the law of the interpenetration of opposites is fundamental, and that is also what gives rise, as we will discuss, to the law of uh, the transformation of, quant of sorry, to the law of the negation of the negation, which, as I said, explains developments. This also involves the logic of contradiction, so opposites that contradict one another, that are involved in one another, that define one another, but also in an antagonism with one another, which is fundamental to understanding motion and developments. Um, this is very important because for us, motion is not something that is external. It's not just that we think it's very general and important, but it, it comes from the inner nature of things, which is not how it is, has been traditionally viewed, for example, in mechanical materialism or in Newtonian mechanics, which tended to treat uh, anything that moves as a result of some external force or some object acting upon it, act, uh, bashing into it. Now, of course, there is such movement. Things do move uh, because something else acted upon them. But that would explain ultimately nothing because, of course, we don't have to ask how it came that that object came to have movement and, and, and therefore caused this object to have movement. And so that ultimately, therefore, we need to be able to understand self-movement. Um, the inner impulse of movement that all things must have, because of course everything does uh, change. It's absolutely fundamental to, to matter for it to change. So, and in this idea of self-movement, we have what is essential to it is the idea of, of, of contradiction, of inner contradiction between opposites. That is what gives rise to movement. And with this, we also have the idea of the inseparability of opposites. So, in other words, the opposites aren't to be understood as just things that are very different from one another, um, you know, as like the most different that something can be. That's, that is often how the words opposite uh, are taken. But for us, what it means is opposites that define one another and are inseparable from one another. And in mo movement, of course, to have movements, which has, as, is a result of these contradictions, whatever they may be, no one side can gain preponderance over the other. Because if it did, then all movement would come to an end. Because movement is a product, not of this side of the contradiction or that side, but of the fact of the contradiction itself, of this unavoidable tension that, that uh, things are bound up with. And if you, if you take that away, if you, for example, assert that there is only attraction and not repulsion, um, then you, it will become inexplicable how change happens. And that is also a problem for science. For example, you have this problem of... of the second law of thermodynamics that explains entropy, whereby things lose energy over time and they become disorganised. And this is a problem for physics because many people say, well, if it's the, in the nature of things to lose energy, to lose motion, if you like, then surely eventually everything will just die, will just cease to move. But of course, there is also the other side to the equation, the, the, the origins of energy which have to be explained. And if you only take one side of it, in other words, the tendency towards losing energy, then it becomes impossible to understand how you ever had energy in the first place. The two must go together and, and, and produce one another, really. Um, now, anyway, let's talk about some concrete examples because this is sounding rather abstract, perhaps. Um, so let's take the example of capitalist society, which, of course, as Marxists, we are very interested in. Here we have something that moves itself. Okay, Capitalism has a history, it develops, it goes forwards. Capitalism today is very different from what it was 200 years ago. So it has something that makes it move, and that is a whole host of contradictions. But in particular, the most fundamental one is the contradiction between the classes uh, in particular the capitalist class and the working class. But the capitalist class and the working class are not to be understood separately. In other words, the capitalists aren't 
capitalists just because they sort of got the capitalist gene or something and in themselves they're just simply capitalists actually capitalists can only be capitalists because there are workers because capitalists collectively monopolize the means of production uh, and therefore workers are forced to come to them to work and can therefore be exploited by capitalists and that's how capitalists generate profits of course um, so capitalists can't be capitalists without the existence of workers and similarly workers as workers can only be like that because they are deprived of access to the means of production they don't own factories or anything like that and have to therefore go to those who do to the capitalists and sell their labor power to them and in doing so of course become exploited and get reproduced as workers now so you have these two sort of these two opposites that define one another that are inseparable that make no sense in isolation and also that are bound up not just not only are they different and depend upon one another but that also means that they must be in an antagonistic relationship in other words the interests of the capitalists are the opposite literally the opposite from the interests of the workers and that creates a tension that creates a struggle in other words a class struggle it produces all kinds of effects but that effectively basically produces history and gives uh, the capitalist system its impulse to drive it forwards if you like and to develop itself um, and but there are many many other examples take i mean everything is an example of it take the example of, of light and uh, the ability to see things we have of course a whole host of colors and of the general fact of light or the absence of light but by themselves each one of those things doesn't really produce anything that we can see so if you could only see light uh, like bright light whiteness essentially or any particular color that would effectively be the same as being blind so it's not this or that colour really that is the important thing, but it's the contradictions between them. If you like the antagonisms and the contrasts that they make, that's what allows us to see anything and to distinguish objects essentially. Without that, of course, uh, it'd be impossible to see anything. Um, you can find these opposites everywhere you look, part and whole, you know, up and down. And we discussed, when we discussed uh, right back at the beginning of the course, when we discussed the fact that anything that exists has to be determined in a definite way. Something can't just simply exist, but it has to have specific qualities, if you like, uh, and, and that this creates its, its behaviour. Well, these qualities, again, are also always bound up in opposites. So we say something's hard or it's soft, or it's large or it's small, it's tall or it's shorter. It's this colour, which therefore means it's not another colour. It's wet or it's dry, etc. We could go on forever. Uh, this is really how everything stands in, in these fundamental relations, which we, and it is bound up in these relations as well. We discussed how things are not merely parts that are indifferent to one another, but they are made up of parts that ha, you know that are dependent on one another. That's how we get un, come to understand the qualities that something has, and that was very important to discuss in quantity and quality. Well, it's also fundamental to discussing you know, the interpenetration of opposites and the negation of the negation. I'll, I'll let Hegel describe this because I think he can explain it better than me. And he really brought back this study of opposites, uh, this dialectical study of opposites back into philosophy. And he says the following in the um, Encyclopedia Logics section 119. He says, positive and negative are supposed to express an absolute difference. The two, however, are at bottom the same. The name of either might be transferred to the other. Thus, for example, debts and assets are not two particular self-subsisting species of property. What is negative to the debtor is positive to the creditor. A way to the east is also a way to the west. Positive and negative are therefore intrinsically conditioned by one another and are only in relation to one another. The north pole of the magnet cannot be without the south pole and vice versa. If we cut a magnet in two, we have not a north pole in one piece and a south pole in the other. Similarly, in electricity, the positive and the negative are not two diverse and independent fluids. In opposition, the different is not confronted by another, but by its other. Now, in, when we discussed quantity and quality, um, which of course, as I've already explained, involves two opposites, we discussed how this also unites the opposites of stasis and change and that 
if we understand everything just in one or the other, if we just cling to one side of the opposition, in other words, if we just say, oh, everything stays the same, or everything changes, then it ends up being nonsense. There must be some synthesis between the two, and the, the law of quantity and quality uh, it really serves that purpose. But I think stasis and change can also be rephrased ultimately as attraction and repulsion and for me that is the most fundamental opposite that exists in nature that anything that exists has to have uh, can only exist by virtue of a certain attraction or stasis if you like it must be held together in a certain way in order to have definite quality but on the other hand it must also have repulsion afterwards it must have change it must have movement must have tension within it Otherwise, again, it wouldn't really exist. It wouldn't have any reason to change or to express itself in any way. It wouldn't have any actual uh, behaviour or qualities. Um, and I think this is this is fundamental to all of existence, and we see it uh, across nature. In, for example, the atoms. You know, even if you look at an atom, you find these fundamental opposing particles. You know, electrons and positrons, etc. Um, now, many philosophical problems. I think, are a result of clinging one-sidedly to one part of an antithesis where it should be really brought together. And there's so many examples of this. You know, is human nature a result of nature or nurture? Um, that would be one example. As if it has to be one or, just one or the other in perfect isolation. Um, stasis versus change, as we've already discussed. Uh, another classic problem of the ancient Greek philosophers was whether or not we have the one or the many. In other words, is at bottom everything the same, made of the same stuff? Or is the most fundamental truth that everything is different? As if it has to be one or the other in, in, in totality, in, in isolation. Um, another example would be, is something a product of its inward character or its outward character? And this, has a, this is a very old philosophical problem and it has an application in terms of ethics. So we have this ethical problem of, is, is it um, moral to, if I want to do something good, if I want to help someone, if, if, that's the, if I try to help someone, but if I end up hurting them, is that, have I committed an immoral act or is the fact that I intended, genuinely intended something good, is that enough to mean that I acted morally or that I am morally right? Well, you would tend to say that, uh, yes, you know, it's a mistake and it's not your fault. And so long as you intend good things, then you are then you are moral. However, it would also be absurd to suggest that all you need to do is to have nice thoughts, to want nice things for people, but not actually make a serious effort to make sure that you achieve that in practice. Um, you only, you know, you just need to think, then you don't even need to do anything at all, really, as long as you think nice thoughts. That would also be ridiculous. So the internal and the external need to be brought into relation to one another. And again, the, the, the fundamental character of anything must be a combination of these opposites, of the internal character and the external character. So the inner nature of something, as I said, everything must have some inner impulse to movements. Movement is not merely from external you know, uh, objects. Uh, but at the same time, that inner character drives it outwards and gives it a certain relation towards another, other things. And similarly, the inner nature of anything is also just the product of the external environment acting upon that thing as well. So let's take the example of an acorn, which Hegel always liked to use. An acorn is clearly not an oak tree. It's not the same thing, clearly. In fact, in a lot of ways, it's completely different. The shape of it is entirely different, doesn't have any branches, doesn't have any leaves, and of course it's far, far smaller. So it's a very, very different thing. And yet an acorn will, given the right external conditions, it will inevitably become an oak tree. So there is some fundamental connection between the two things. What we can say is that an oak tree is a result of the synthesis between an acorn or the inner character of an acorn and the correct external environment or conditions. So this brings us onto the question of development, right? That development, um, passing from one to the other, involves these contradictions of, of, of such as inner and uh, inner and external, for example. Um, I think all development takes place through this kind of oscillation between these opposites, you know, uh, inner and external, for example, young and old, parents and child uh, are other examples. 
And this brings us on to the law of the negation of the negation. Um, this is a very kind of misunderstood thing. I'll just give a quotation from Engels just to, because um, I think he can explain it better than me again. So Engels says, let us take a grain of barley. Billions of such grains of barley are milled, boiled and brewed and then consumed. But if such a grain of barley meets with conditions which are normal for it, if it falls in on suitable soil, then under the influence of heat and moisture, it undergoes a specific change. It germinates. The grain as such ceases to exist. It is negated and in its place appears the plant which has arisen from it, the negation of the grain. But what appears... Uh, sorry, but what is the normal life process of this plant? It grows, it flowers, is fertilised and finally once more produces grains of barley. And as soon as these have ripened, the stalk dies is, uh, and is in its turn negated. And as, um, as a result of this negation of the negation, we have once again the original grain of barley, but not as a single unit, but 10, 20 or 30 fo fold. This also involves another dialectical concept, which is um, known as sublation, which Hegel developed. To sublate something is to negate it, but also to preserve it. Now, in formal logic and in just normal kind of linear thought, if something is destroyed, we just say it's destroyed. The idea of it being preserved is kind of ignored or not thought about. And it might seem a rather strange thing to say. Uh, but without that concept of sublation, how do we explain the fact that um, that an acorn, once the tree has died or once it's departed from that tree, it produces another tree remarkably similar to the one that gave rise to it. So clearly there must be something that is preserved. So this, of course, involves the concept of development. This idea of sublation is all about the, the concept of development. Um, now, once again, I'm going to give a quotation from Engels. I think it's very good. He talks about um, the opposite of development, which is and the opposite of sublation and negation in the dialectical sense, which is simply to destroy something. He says the following. He says, negation in dialectics does not mean simply saying no or declaring that something does not exist or destroying it in any way one likes. Long ago, Spinoza said, every limitation or determination is at the same time a negation. And further, the kind of negation is here determined firstly by the general and secondly by the particular nature of the process. So the acorn, in the acorn, is crystallised the, if you like, the character of the oak tree, and in fact all of previous development that gave rise to it. It's not just an accident that an acorn happens to produce an oak tree. It didn't just pop into existence and miraculously had this characteristic. It is a product of a process of, of development in which the useful characteristics, if you like, of things get preserved and uh, in, in a way that allows them to be grown once again. Uh, so there's mi literally millions of years of development, in a sense, is expressed in this acorn. So we can say, to go back to a Hegelian phrase, in the acorn is its other, its opposite, which is the oak tree. It may appear totally different from an oak tree, but it inevitably gives rise to that oak tree. It doesn't just, might just, might not just, it, it's not like it might just turn out to give rise to a human being or, or some other plant. It will always give rise to an oak tree and nothing else. There's nothing accidental about it. So the negation of the negation expresses the fact that movement is not arbitrary. It's not just the case that everything moves, but that matter is self-organised. Um, it's not just utter chaos, um, but we have laws, we have predictability, um, and a kind of certain harmony, if you like, to nature. And this, and over time, we have this phenomenon in nature of development because of that self-organisation. And we see that most clearly, of course, in evolution. But I think you can see it not only in evolution, but all across nature. In which, you know, why does evolution work? Not because God intended it or anything or because it should happen, but simply because what works is preserved. In other words, if an animal or a plant develops a mutation which helps it to produce or to, to reproduce, then that feature will be preserved. And therefore, over time, we have, tend to have increasing complexity and the useful features being preserved. Now, of course, it's not a simple or a uniform process, uh, but generally that is the case. And the, the negation of negation helps us to understand this.
And this brings to bring, brings us to an, a, a very interesting point, which is that in philosophy, there has always been this tendency to see matter as just chaos, as meaningless, you know, unthinking matter, that is, as just a sort of, you know, meaningless chaos. And it's mind, it's consciousness that gives order and purpose to things. And this, this way of looking at the world was used by William Paley in his famous teleological argument to argue for the existence of God. Because he said, well, look, if you look at the world, you look at the solar system, we see tremendous harmony, we see predictability, we see regularity, you know, we see nice shapes like spheres in the planets, things like this. And this is far too kind of ordered to have just randomly come together with no, you know, guiding consciousness. So it must be that God gave rise to this. That's the only explanation that there can be, according to Paley. Therefore, of course, God exists. Um, and a, a lot of people have do take a look at this and they think, yeah, this is very convincing. It's very hard to see how nature could have just, without consciousness, given rise to this incredibly ordered and harmonious system, which include highly complex animals. Well, what a dialectical materialist worldview and what the negation of the negation helps us to understand is that at bottom, matter is organised. As we discussed, it must be organised. You can't have utter chaos. Everything must preserve themselves, at least for a time, and have determinate qualities. That's what existence is. For anything to exist, it must be like that. And over time, this general feature to matter gives rise to development where features get preserved. And, and again, the most obvious example of this is, of course, evolution, in which the, the laws of, of matter are utilised, in a sense, to enable something to reproduce, not because it wanted to or because God decided it should happen, but simply because it can happen, because the regular laws of nature enable this to happen and eventually it will happen. And once it does happen, such an animal or a single celled organism will be able to preserve those features which allow it to exist. And of course, variations get preserved as well. And, and th oh, this brings me on to the final point, in fact, which is that through the negation of negation, we have developments from the lower to the higher. We don't simply have these cycles, but we have cycles in a kind of upward spiral. And, and uh, we can see an example of that in the case of the acorn. Engels gives the example that the, the acorn gets reproduced in greater numbers. So one acorn produces one oak tree, but then ultimately that oak tree produces many acorns. But that's not all. You also have evolution in which the new acorns have genetic variation from their parents. Most of the time, of course, that's fairly incidental and doesn't really produce any significant change. But of course, over a very long period of time and with changes in the external conditions, those changes become important enough to say that we have a new species. And of course, that only happens if those changes are useful. So we have preserved through this process that which is useful. And therefore, we have a kind of order built in, a regularity built into nature without any recourse to God or any consciousness, simply because that which it works preserves itself. And I think that the law of the negation of the negation is fundamental to understand that. We have to have ultimately some way of explaining without recourse to God why nature is ordered, why we have over time increasingly complex uh, animals appearing. And I think that without the negation of the negation, it would be impossible to explain that. Um, so anyway, that, that really um, finishes our discussion of the negation of the negation and the, the interpenetration of opposites. Uh, next week, we will be discussing the relationship between part and whole, which is quite closely related, but also uh, different. So I'll see you for that. Lenin stated that without revolutionary theory, there can be no revolutionary movement. Without a revolutionary theory, we are bound to take in the ideas that surround us. Under capitalism, these are ideas that ultimately defend the status quo. In Wellrad's upcoming book on the history of philosophy, Alan Woods looks at the development of philosophical thinking from the ancient Greeks all the way through to Marx and Engels, who brought together the best of previous thinking to produce the Marxist philosophical outlook which looks at the real material world, not as a static, immovable reality, but one that is constantly changing and moving according to laws that can be discovered. Through this, we can learn how philosophy becomes an indispensable tool in the struggle for the revolutionary transformation of society.
pre-order your copy now at www.marxist.com slash H-O-P.